Welcome back to another Badminton Talk podcast. It's Saturday, it's 11 o'clock. From Dublin, Ireland, this is John Noble and... Mark Topping. Hiya, Mark. Welcome back to you. Good to talk to you again. Yes, John, great to be back. Looking forward again to more chat on the Badminton Talk podcast. How are you keeping? Yeah, keeping great, Mark. You know, we just have to... Hopefully, the, the, you know, the vaccine jabs are coming out um, and I just can't wait to get back on a badminton court and start travelling also to other tournaments. I can't wait. It can come quicker, Mark. Absolutely, John. Where are we? We're around about March the 24th, 25th as we record this and um, it looks from the media, it looks like maybe by September the vast majority of people in the population will be vaccinated and we could start to head back to normal. I'm keeping my fingers crossed anyway. I can't wait to get back to Bampton in September. September 21 or 2, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> That's <Sorry>. a good question. <laughs> Open 21. Um, okay, Mark, we'll get going because we have 34 minutes to pack into this and of course... Uh, um, the introduction to our guest is, um, let's hear. If you want the truth, it's the future, but it seems on you. I want it all, I want it all, I want it all, I want it now. Yeah, Mark, do you like that? Ray Stevens at the age of 11, he certainly wanted it all. Would that be fair enough? Yeah, oh, it was so fascinating to listen to him in part one last week. So this is part two we're going into. And yeah, uh, wow, oh, what an attitude he had to certainly the physical training. And he was very generous with his mentor, his uh, arts teacher that uh, introduced him to the wonderful sport of Bampton and encouraged him. Yeah, And also those three Malaysian guys, I never knew about them. Um, yeah. They seem to have an also... A, a huge impact at a significant moment in his time. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Okay, so we're here. As Mark has nicely introduced um, Ray Stevens. So um, I think what we'll do, Mark, is I think we will stop talking and we'll go back to the interview. What do you think, Mark? Absolutely. I can't, can't wait to hear Ray again. Okay, here we go. Okay, uh, tell us, Ray, about the running track. That was um, the third form of running, and you do a style each day. So one day I would do the interval running, another day I'd do the um, uh, hill sprints, but the track work was the hardest. The track work was definitely the hardest. And that was about an hour and 20 minute session. And it's um, started off with short sprints, which I will call 50 meter sprints, 10. Um, it took a long while uh, and 10 backwards running. And then you'd walk back to the start. So you'd go your 50 meters, run and walk back. And all the time you'd be walking back, you're gonna say, build up the speed in your head and say, I'm going to really attack the next one. So you, you were trying to say it's like a starting pistol going off, bang, you were going to go as fast as you could. Then there was 10 times 100 metres, mm -hmm. 6 times 200 metres, and when you did the 200 metres, you'd just walk across the track uh, a straight line, and then you do the 200 metres again, and then you do two times 400 metres, one times 800 metres, wow. and then finish off with a 3,000 metre. Jeez, I'm exhausted, Ray. Christ almighty, that was, that's, I mean, that's savage. That's, I mean, uh, by the way, I'm not saying savage isn't what it takes, but I'm just listening to a lot of our listeners who um, are getting a real insight to what training is really about? Um, you know, that's not that's what they're not used. That, they're not used to that. That's different. No. And I'm going to tell you, at 13 years of age, mm. Darren Hall was doing that. 
You're Darren kidding. who wow. was doing that at 13. At 16, he was beating uh, top internationals. Yeah. Um, and Darren um, did the training that I asked of him, and he was phenomenally fast. Uh, uh, Morgan Frost actually said mm. he was as fast as a Chinese. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. That's that. But but he obviously, he, he, as maybe talented as he might have been, he worked really hard to get himself well, worked, to that. Worked so hard. Yeah. Worked so hard. And that's the um, And that's the reason he was uh, such a good player because he had correct training from an early age. I was very protective of Darren. Hmm. We always did the tuck jumps and stuff like that on soft surfaces. We had a dojo, which is uh, the judo mats on the floor where they uh, jump up and down, which made it a lot more difficult for jumping, but it was a soft service and protecting our knees. So I was always um, very conscious of the body. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's funny, Ray, obviously um, Mark Topping did a lot of um, 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 learning from you because Mark is doing the exact same. One of my, um, uh, Dylan, my, my young, well, he's set 14, uh, Mark is saying he's got to be so careful when he's training um, that he is always watching, the, you know, the base, that it's springboard, it's not heavy stuff um, because he made the point, you know, when you are 13, 14, 15, 16, your body is growing and the tissues are growing. developing. And Absolutely. if you mess them up at that age, I mean, you, 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 I don't need to tell you, um, you, you you're then going to, um, you know, do, do, do harm as opposed to... Um, harm. Absolutely. And I understand your uh, son is, a, is of a smaller stature, mm. but Darren... When he was 13, 14, even 15, uh, was a five-foot spit. Mm. 16, 17, all of a sudden, the growth spurt hit in, and he's now six foot one. Incredible. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So, so like we know juveniles listening to this podcast and listening to you, Ray, um, um, uh, Ray Stevens, um, w w you know, juveniles, they grow at different ages and you've got to let your, Absolutely. as Mark would say again, sorry, Mark Corny, again, when you sleep, you grow. Yeah. You know? Um, Absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of the sleep for juveniles, especially as they go maybe through a growth spurt. Uh, let them sleep is what I say. Uh, that's uh, how they're going to get bigger and stronger. But, but I'm going to say um, our advice today in uh, modern times is for ballistic stretching. We always used to do uh, ballistic stretching, static stretching, and developmental stretching. And we'd incorporate that every day. And so you get the physical experts now and they say um, uh, that type of stretching's out. You have a top Chinese team, and I mean the national team, come to Dublin or come to Belfast, you'll see them stretching all the time. What is ballistic stretching? Sorry, uh, Ray. Uh, okay. Curious, I know stretching. some listeners might be asking. I know um, a lot of... Okay, ballistic stretching. You go into the... Uh, Pull, you start jogging around, yeah. and then you bring a knee up to your chest, either side, yeah. so you can remember, or you uh, uh, tap your buttocks with your um, heels. Yeah. Uh, that's ballistic stretching. You're stretching actively. Right. Uh, a ballistic stretch would also be a um, uh, go down into a lunge and feel the lunge. Go yes. down to, into a lunge. That's ballistic stretching. And then you might even have uh, a lunge jump from one side to another. But it's certainly not um, where you're going down and you're trying to uh, lengthen um, your hamstring or okay. uh, yes. push your back. Oh, well, one of the exercises that we used to do was... Um, uh, do walks down the wall. So you'd uh, bend your back right over, 
put your hands on the wall and then bend down. But you've got to remember my early um, uh, uh, sport was gymnastics. Right. So you, yeah. So you had there was flexibility in the uh, there was already as, uh, and as, always as me. Yeah. flexibility there. And believe me, uh, Kevin Jolly was um, a superb athlete, but he was very, very flexible as well. Yeah, I remember mm. when he came over. I <laughs> Ray, this is just fascinating to listen yeah. to you. Sorry, Mark, we're, we're just caught in there, but it's okay. You want to? I, I, I'm going to talk about just the ice pack to Ray for one second. Uh, sorry, Mark. Okay. <laughs> yeah, go on. Uh, Kevin Jolly came okay. over to play a Babington um, Open International, a, a Masters there a couple of years ago. I, I, yeah. I, I really, I, I'd seen the guy, never met him, but I, I started talking to him, and he w had this ice pack, and he was lying. It was in Baldoyle. He was lying. Um, down with the ice pack on, and and I would notice this happening every time he'd finished a, a game. And I went, I kind of was very close by him. I said, uh, Kevin, do you mind me asking? I'm really curious. I've never. I said we're going to run out of ice in this country. There's so much ice on your legs. I said, how serious is the injury? He says, I'm not injured at all. He said, oh, I said, you're not know. I'm just getting my body to recover as quick as it can for the next game. The more ice I can pack in it, the quicker I get back out in court. I just thought to myself, this guy, he must have been, I don't know, 50, maybe at the time, maybe 52, I don't know. Yeah. If that was his attitude at that age, what was he like when he was in his 20s? And, and, and that's the genre you, you and him and were playing. That was phenomenal. We could have a whole podcast on Kevin Jolly because <laughs> he was an incredible character. Always getting himself in at problems. He'd say this. Always very charismatic. Um, yeah. A racket thrower. Uh, he was called the uh, John Rack and Row of Badminton. Always people would graduate to his call uh, because they knew something was going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And it did all yeah. the time. Uh, the number of times I've had him here, sitting in my garden in London uh, telling him how to uh, write a letter of apology to <laughs> Arthur, the AFB to stop him getting banned. Um, but he's a great, great friend, uh, very spiritual these days. Right. And from an early age, and I'm going to say probably 22, 23, mm -hmm. he got very traumatic injuries that he wouldn't have opened up to you about, John. Wow. But he's lucky he can walk. My goodness tonight. My goodness tonight. Yeah. Mm. So, so, so uh, sometimes people have more problems yeah, than, than people, uh, people realise. But Kevin was a marvellous person. I've seen him win the uh, Taiwanese Open beating two world champions in the same tournament. One was Fleming Dills, and the other one was um, Aichuk Sugiyatu in the yes. final, which uh, the England manager at the time, he said to me, what's he got to do? I said, exactly what he's doing. Just stay in, play for a point, play for the next point, the next point. And it was eight all in the third and Sugiato came down with cramp. Oh, my God. There you go. There you go. The advice was, was well, the listen match, to. The match was brutal. Brutal. Yeah. And uh, all, all power to Kevin. Yeah. Well, 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 that, well, well, Ray, we might just talk on another podcast, you and Kevin, you're giving Mark and myself loads of ideas. We, this is fascinating <laughs> stuff here. This is like, yeah. we're, we're, we're like walk, walking down a road. We've gone a side avenue. Now we've gone off a lane off a side avenue. Uh, I'm, I'm we... going to make a <laughs> short point to you both. Yeah. When I was playing badminton, did you Never won a national title. Yeah. He won the Japan Open. Yeah. He won the, uh, with Chinese players in it. He won other tournaments as well. Mm. Steve Butler mm. never won a national title. But he beat the world number one, which is Thomas Stuart Larson. 
Yes. In the final of the Scottish. Wow. The point I'm trying to make mm. is where have our, all our world-class singles players gone? They've gone. They've gone because they get turned over to doubles and no one wants to take on the challenge. Thank God for your daughter. <laughs> well, well, I, I mean, um, there's, there's, there. Uh, th thanks for staying that Ray, and there's hopefully a few of them that that are are, are going to um, um, stay the, the 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 Ray Stevens path of of this incredible game of badminton, which we know in in all discipline, but singles is is just um, is is phenomenal to 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 watch. Um, you know, uh, w watch it even watching some old recordings as well as watching some some new recordings. Um, so thank you very much, Ray, for say st saying that. Um, I think Mark wants to. I can kind of see him here in the Zoom. He's trying to jump in and ask a question. Sorry, Mark. I I, I should have let you in before now. So it's over to you now. <laughs> okay. No, no worries, no worries. No, it was just I'd like to take Ray back to a question. That I asked earlier, but as you say, this is the lovely thing about podcasts. You can go in any direction, and I love it. But the question I maybe we'll concentrate on this time is, Ray, do you remember your debut for the England badminton team? Who did you play against? Who did you play with? And what age were you? Okay, that's a good question, but I can remember. I've got a good memory, Mark, uh, for scores and everything, and... Uh, Yes. I was 19 years of age. It was in the Carlisle Market Hall. It was England versus Scotland. And I was playing against a Scottish lad, a really nice Scottish lad. He's dead now. He was a very good golfer as well. And his name was Nickel McCloy. Nickel McCloy was so different to me. He didn't have a hair out of place. If uh, you went to his uh, drawer in his uh, hotel room, everything would be folded and unpacked properly. He was a, a super guy, and I think he was in HR for, and had a very, very good reputation. I played him. I don't think he knew what hit him. I beat him 15-love, 15-6. <laughs> Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. yeah that's a brilliant story. Oh, very, very good. You didn't play doubles in that match? Uh, I didn't play doubles in that match. But they give you the... Scotland was considered... And I love Scotland, and their players are really good, and I've always had a full respect for their players. But Scotland was uh, considered the soft option where you blooded. Um, your new blood. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> actually, that, 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 I know you, you played. You played singles. You're actually very rare. I think, uh, particularly in these days, you played very high level singles. But you also played incredibly high level men's doubles. And in some ways, you you, know, you got almost better results in the men's doubles. Okay. Um, and and and. When did you start to partner up with your long-term partner, Mike Tredgett? And, and, and maybe give us maybe what matches or results stood out for you in your long career together as a doubles okay. pair. What, 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 what championships did you win that gave you the most satisfaction? Okay. Um, mm. We had... Uh, that's a very good point, actually, Mark. I played with Mike Tredgett from the age of 19. We were both just out of juniors. He was a very, very talented doubles player. And I was a big hitter, and he was great at laying the shuttle off. We complemented each other. Mm. And the really point, good point you're making here, at that time, and even at 19, we played the European Championships uh, European champions at the time, which was Dave Eddy and Robert Powell. Mm -hmm. And they won it in the years that I'm talking about. And we played them in the final of the championships at the old Wimbledon Hall, and we beat them 15-2, 15-2. 
we uh, had that's called right. a hockey <laughs> yeah we, we had arrived yeah. and uh, England at the time had three world class doubles players Elliot Stewart who was a great player and if you said to anyone who do you want to play with in the team they'd all say Elliot he never lifted the shuttle he had a brilliant short serve, great defence, great at laying off the shuttle and played for his partner brilliantly. He played with Derek Talbot. Then you had a pair called Dave Eddy and Eddie Sutton. Dave Eddy and Eddie Sutton were the third pair. Mike and I were the second pair. There were yeah. only two places in the team. Wow. Yeah. So you were biting each other's ankles to try and get in the team. To tell you how good our third pair was, they won the Danish Open. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Strength and depth. What a str- yeah, what strength and depth there. Um, um, I, I, want to, I want to obviously... Um, uh, welcome again all our listeners from all over the world, um, from Denmark, from China, all our English listeners in particular, and those who follow Babington, we have here uh, Ray Stevens, not the American singer-songwriter who was famously sung, Everything is Beautiful, and, and I knew that wasn't Ray, the clue was um, he's 81, and the date of birth on the Ray, the legendary Ray Stevens, is the 23rd of June, um, which, funny enough, uh, Ray Stevens is the birthday of Zinedine Zidane and Alan Turner, the great English mathematician. Not sure if you knew that, and um, there you go, There's because you are... Uh, uh, person with a lot of facts and figures it struck me right from the start my goodness what a memory you have you would have done um and would still do great on 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 television if you had to sit beside Gillian Clark and um Martin Frost and, <laughs> and run all those statistics but my my question anyway before I can let you re- react to that is t- and our listeners will really be excited to know the answer to this what, what were your greatest matches and, and scalps on a singles court? On a singles court, okay. Yeah. Um, that's a really great question, but mm. it'd have to be Morton Frost. Wow. Uh, England beat uh, Denmark for the first time in 40-odd years uh, on a head-to-head um, full match. And I beat Morton wow. uh, in wow. Denmark. Whoa! And I couldn't walk the next day. I could not walk the next day. Can you remember and the score, um, um, Ray, and that match? Because uh, it's been interesting to know the numbers there. But if you can't, it doesn't matter. Okay, if, I'm pretty sure it was three ends. Yeah. We would have really gone the distance because you couldn't beat Morton attacking him. Yeah. You had to run him. You had to run him, and you had to make sure he made every step that you made. Yeah. So yeah. it was very tactical. and But that wasn't my only win over Morton. I beat him in the second round of uh, the Swedish, which I wow. can remember the score. I knocked him off the court, 59-15-6. Wow. And he, and he was number one seed, and it was, we were first round. That's and incredible. I think he That's fantastic. A bit, a bit surprised of that, and I can remember my thoughts during that match. And I thought, well, I'm against Morton. I train harder than this. I train much harder than this. This, is, this isn't as hard as people think, you know. So reverse psychology. I was taking the job on. I wanted the job, and funny enough, I'm. I, I hope we're going to get into affirmations at some mm-hmm. time during the pro- podcast. You will, yeah. My affirmation all through my career was train hard, fight easy. And I got that off the of martial arts. Train, train hard, hard, fight easy. Wow. Easy. Yeah. So-, so that means you put in all the training necessary, go into the match, relax. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. What, what, what a wonderful, um, 
What a wonderful mindset you had, Ray. Just there's, there's a real insight to any young badminton player now. You've given away currency is what we call it there, with what you've just said in the last minute. You know, you, you, you're up against the number one seed. You're up against a player who's seated higher than you. You're playing someone who wears a Danish shirt and they're putting you off a little bit and your Irish shirt is not as good or your, your Chinese or whatever the country is. I'm just, just picking that because we're, we're broadcasting this from Dublin, Ireland. And you there and all you're thinking of, I'm better at this than that guy. What a wonderful and thought. It's just, I think that's yeah. just, that's before, brilliant. Before we go off of affirmations, yes. I, want to, I want to put this out as a challenge, particularly to the young um, athletes. Yes. Give me three affirmations. I'm going to give you my three. Okay. Train hard, fight easy. First one. Second one. Mountains are conquered one step at a time. Yeah. Third one is, if not you, then who? If not now, then when? Are you prepared to pay the price? Wow. I have one um, that I can do. Uh, that I, they're they're amazing. They're just amazing, um, um, and um, they're just. I think any juvenile listening needs to write them down, um, put them on a wall, look at them. Um, I heard but one. Think their own. Which? But think their own. Something that relates to them, because one of our jobs as top coaches is to get our players to think the biggest muscle in the body, get it working. Because all the players think they've got to do their shadow babbling and their skimming, mm. their everything else. They've got to exercise their mind, work out what it takes in the game. We'll get on to this student of the game, learn Everything that the game takes. Well, uh, I we will come back to that before before we we finish, um, uh, Ray. I just want to throw one out that I that just came to me, um, and I was just thinking there about you talking about your time um, on court number five. For whatever reason, I remembered that mm-hmm. trying to train there, and then the, the the players would come in, and you'd be kicked off, and what would you do? You'd go running. So so time is always at the essence, and time is at the essence. And when we're young, we probably don't 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 realize it. Um, but you know, to to anyone that gets the opportunity to train and walk on a court, don't count the minutes. Make the minutes count. Fantastic. That's my. And there's a great book that was written by the uh, disgraced. Lance Armstrong, mm. and it, it, the title of it was Every Second Crown Counts. It's a great book. It's a shame it was a cheat. Yes. Yeah. 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 No, absolutely. I mean, obviously, um, he, he was so ambassadorial for a long time before absolutely. the house came tumbling down. Um, 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 God, I was just thinking of the Tesco ad there for a second. Every cent counts. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Yeah. it just it just occurred. Sorry, that was just a, a moment there. But those affirmations, yeah. John, can I can yeah. I move on? And because this is really where I I remember Ray. Obviously, Ray the player. We've talked a lot about Ray the player, but um, I first met Ray in 1997 when he was appointed the part time badminton coach to the Irish badminton team. And I, he just transformed the way I looked at badminton just in the three or four years. I learned so much from Ray. So I'm really interested in Ray, how did you get into coaching and why did you get into coaching? And maybe just a follow-up question, what is your philosophy in badminton coaching? Oh, that's a big one. Mm. Um, can I just tell you about one incredible game that I played in singles? Because... I played oh, against gosh. all the top Danes, Morton Frost, Erland, Sven, had magnificent and games with, had a better record against Stuart Jonsson. But the game I'm going to pick is Rudy Hartoner, eight times winner of the uh, All England, 
are playing in at the Albert Hall. He right. Beats, oh. He beats players to zero all the time. He's so fantastic. Wow. TV cameras, people in the Albert Hall, I'm 14 love down. Wow. <laughs> oh, God. 14 love down. And it was a time when you had to serve to get a point. Yeah. I won that game. You're kidding me. I won that game. Oh, my. How did you do that? God. That, that is. Fight one point at a time. Fight one point at a time and just fight like hell. Get everything back. And I think um, it, to this day, I think it's the most incredible game I've ever played. Yes. Yeah, well, it's certainly the most incredible result, like, to, to, to have that strength in mind. And I know, Ray, um, I don't want to go off subject, but you know the way, uh, if, you're, if you're a badminton coach, you say you need to have a good technical side to a game, you need to have a good yeah. tactical side to a game, you need to have a good physical side to a game, you need to have a good nutritional. But, you know, without the mental side, and boy, do you need to have that in abundance, you're not going to get to the top. Uh, top of your game. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. That's incredible. Um, I, I lost eventually. Uh, I, I got eight and eight, which was good scores against. Uh, uh, I think he beat um, Morton Frost Hanson the next day, six and four. Um, that's the sort of uh, games. But people were going to think, well, that's uh, a one off. When I was 16 years of age, I was playing the Yorkshire number one in the final qualification of the uh, All England um, to get into the first round of the All of England. And I was 14-3 down in the third game. I won that game. <laughs> that, that just, that's a, that, <laughs> never give up. That, never give up. No. Never give up. Never. And the problem is it can work the other way as well. Mm. No one ever got a free point off of me. Yeah, and, and, and Ray, were you like that in practice as well? Uh, no, I wasn't. So mm. I'm going to tell you what I did in practice. Mm. If someone was a brilliant runner, I'd run against them. Yeah. If someone was a brilliant uh, doubles player, I'd play doubles against them. Yeah. If someone was brilliant at the net, I'd take him on at the net. I use their strengths all the time, and when it came to a tournament, oh, yeah. I completely reverse it and use their weaknesses. And I would know them because I would have noted it down. Yes, yes. So, so wow. So rather than playing, everyone had a page on. Everyone yeah. had a page on them. Uh, I, I told Kevin when uh, we're, we're very good friends now. I told Kevin. Um, not so long ago, and I had uh, a very good record against Kevin. I said, I always used to play you off your best shot. I put it up into his backhand side, and he had the most phenomenal cut from his backhand side uh, go across court uh, to, to the net. Yes. But he played it four out of five times. So um, I'd push it up there, it would go there, and I'd get into that net like a bullet, Cause try, and push, try and put a spin on it. Now he's got to come full distance, and he's, if he lifted well, I'd play the rally on until he did it again. It's a very simple tactic. Um, if he lifted short, now I've got him. Yes. So, and uh, he said, "Oh, I never quite worked that one out, you know." Um, but we're very, very good friends, and uh, it, it, it occurs to me that you would be very good at chess because chess is about working okay. out the next movement. So you knew where to put it to where it's going to move into kind of position, and and yeah. and therefore, you know, this kind of again, th th this. Um, 
quality content you're unlocking here on this Babington Talk podcast, uh, Ray, is phenomenal. There is a huge, and I know Mark is a good chess player too. He tells me he likes chess. Um, I love it. Yeah. So, um, to, you know, it's not just about going out there and hitting the shuttle. It's, it, there's so much else yeah. to be, uh, and the preparation you did in advance, um, knowing exactly the weaknesses and strengths of your opponents. As someone often said to me, sure. sometimes playing to someone's forehand is the best, best tactic because that is their weakness, yeah. not their back- backhand. Mm. Mm. But I'd say this, and everyone's going to be different working about five or six moves ahead. That's what we work to. Wow. Five or six moves ahead. And uh, not everyone's going to have that ability, but what I say to youngsters, and particularly uh, your your young athletes, uh, John, is start the book, open the page. What do they do from there? Do they cross court it when you uh, smash down the forehand side or backhand side? Mm-hmm. Do they play straight and add, add, add? And you get better and better and better at reading the game. But you've got to start reading the game. And most people are a bit slow to put pen to paper. Yes. I wasn't. But you two are good teachers. There's so many different ways a youngster can learn. Yes. One is uh, what we're saying is um, writing it down. One is being told it. Another is visual. And I'm sure kinetic or uh, anything Mm. you want want to say, um, you've got to find your person's learning style. And I'm going to give you a very quick um, example of this. Uh, when I was coaching a very good ladies uh, side, um, which was Imogen Bankia and Emma Mason, mm-hmm. um, you could give Imogen Bankia as much information as you wanted. Emma, who was a very bright girl, yeah. you had to keep it incredibly simply. Wow. And then, and then, if you were teaching her something, she wouldn't get it that day. The next day, she'd come back and she's got it. Right. That's so how, that was her. Diff- yeah. Mm. Yeah. They're, they're different learning styles, and you've got to see how your athlete takes in the information. Yeah. Um, Ray, um, we are going to take another pause and um, we will move on to the next part of this uh, podcast with Ray Stevens. We will move on next week. Mark, that is phenomenal information from Ray Stevens. My goodness, I can't believe 36 minutes went by that quick, Mark. Absolutely, John. That was just fantastic. Particularly his last point there. As coaches, we need to be very aware of uh, everybody has a different learning style, a preferred learning style. I think we, 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 we can all learn, but it's trying to find your students' preferred learning style and, and helping them and encouraging them to uh, think about the game of badminton and, and improve, improve their game, John. Yeah, Mark, um, I couldn't agree more. Um, and um, I, I love the, the mindset that he said about thinking shots ahead, watching players, seeing what their patterns are. And it must be, Mark, that the best players in the world, you know, best men and best women players, they're reading the games better than anybody else. And that might say they mightn't even be as technically better but they're reading the games. They know when I do this, someone does that. They're looking at patterns, Mark. What do you think? Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. That the, the very, very top players in the world obviously can see these patterns very quickly and very early. But they're always watching. And and some people, I think Ray obviously was a, he learned by writing things down, and that is a very good way to learn. But maybe just even. Uh, another method might be you play somebody and you uh, re-visualize the match that you played against them. Go through every point in your head after the match and reflect on it and 
gosh, mm. yeah, that every time I hit it there, they always hit it here, and you will remember that for for the next time you play your opponent. And Mark, what about Ray Stevens down? I know we're nearly out of time. Zero fourteen in the Royal Albert Hall, and he wins that game. How does that happen? <laughs> that's a me. That's just wow. I'd love to know if that video is available. I'd love to see it. Yeah, it's just point by point. He obviously just decided to live in the moment and fight every single point. Um, fantastic, incredible story. Love ah, you know, that. Yeah, that, that, you can you can see why that's stuck in his head. Uh, that is an incredible win from yeah. that position. I mean, my my, I, and we must at some stage exchange affirmations, Mark, between you and me. But his out the the thought, what the, you know, the the wonderful thing Ray said there, and it's a real. It's real currency for juveniles. When he was playing Martin Frost, you know, most players, and I've seen it even, even, even recently in the New Orleans. Some of some players going out playing the number one seed and getting very nervous on the courts, giving them, you know, more than they they, um, they they're due. But if you can work in those players mentally, and if anyone's listening here in our juveniles, his thought was, I've trained harder than Martin Frost, so I have a plus going on to the court. How good does that make you feel, Mark? Yeah, John, that is, it's just a, a brilliant mindset. I, I liked his affirmation, and I was always struck. He always used that when I first met him, uh, train hard, play easy. So it's try to stay nice and relaxed in the game, go onto the court relaxed. Um, yeah, I suppose that uh, easy to say, difficult to do. You're going on against the number one seed, and you're a little bit tense. But if you've trained hard and then you go on and relax and enjoy your game and play your game, you can do some damage. Yeah, brilliant, Mark. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Well, we want to thank all our listeners um, for listening to part two of Ray Stevens. Of course, this has been brought to you by We Couldn't um, Run These Podcasts Without the Q Shuttle. Um, So, fantastic. So... Yeah, that's the music, which is the cue that um, another Babington Talk podcast, Mark, is coming to an end. Um, so quick again, Mark. Yeah, it, yeah, it just flies by, doesn't it, John? It's, it's fascinating guests to listen to them, and just uh, I'm really enjoying it. Yeah, absolutely, Mark. And um, what are you doing this uh, weekend? Any Anything new? I'm gone. I've got a project in the garden at the minute. I'm trying to fix my uh, wild garden and get it sorted. Oh, that's good, Mark. So you're going to go and do a little bit of weeding then? <laughs> <laughs> Just a bit. <laughs> good. I might do a little bit of reading while you're doing weeding. <laughs> Excellent, John. Very good. So you're going to read? Yeah, I am. I think I'm going to read um, something, um, one of these social media books, you know. Um, so I'm just learning a little bit about the clubhouse, Elon Musk's, um, yeah, it's hard to get into the clubhouse and you can find out lots of information. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, so Mark, listen, um, until next, um, Saturday at 11 AM, let's thank all our listeners on the Babington Talk podcast. So, um, we're still in COVID. So we wish you all safe. See you, Mark. Off for now. See you. See you next week, John. Take care. Bye.